Good morning, everybody. We're going to try it again. Good morning, everybody. All right. It's great to see everybody. Um, how many folks here are from, D or from the DMV? OK, raise your hand if you're not from the DMV. That might have been easier. OK, so about 50-50. Um, so I always, whenever, I think sometimes in DC, I live in the DMV area. And sometimes I think we take for granted getting to go to all these cool places to give speeches and give remarks or to see events. Um, so I did a little bit of history on Union Station that I thought I'd share, because we're in this beautiful building. And there's actually a lot of connective thread to, I think, what we're all here gathered to think about. So, you know, Union Station was built at the turn of the century. Um, at its height of operations around World War II, about 200,000 people were coming through this building, which is pretty amazing to think about. Um, there's a long history of revitalization of Union Station, lots of ups, lots of downs. Um, in the 80s, there was a fairly large revitalization effort that was spearheaded by the federal government. Um, and individually led by then Senator Elizabeth Dole, the Secretary of Transportation, who has now emerged as a, as a fairly large leader in our space, thinking about veteran caregiver issues. She was also my former boss when I worked at the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, so I actually know a lot about Union Station. Come, feel free to see me later for facts. Um, but I was trying to think of the connective thread between you know, trains, Union Station, rail, and virtual, virtual reality. And I, I think I'm there. I'm still working on it. I had a couple cups of coffee. But when I think about it, you know, rail really transformed how we thought about how we, what we thought about transportation. Um, you know, we had the ability to or transport people and resources and things from communities big and small, rural and urban, all across the country in a very short amount of time. Um, and VR, to me, holds a very, very similar power. Um, because we're now going to be able to connect patients and healthcare providers so that veterans really have access to the most cutting edge therapies and interventions out there. So um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I told you I'd try to connect Union Station and VR. So I think I get a little bit of credit for at least trying to connect the two. Um, <laughs> but I really appreciated Anne's opening remarks, um, sort of challenging us to think about implementation, challenging us to start to brainstorm what's in the art of the possible? What does the future hold for bringing in these technologies into the VA so that veterans and healthcare providers can access them? Um, and the organization I represent, NAVREF, is I think one of those avenues that holds a tremendous amount of promise. And it's been really, really exciting to engage with Anne and Dr. Kirsch and the whole VA team on this, and excited to share a little bit of this early thinking with you. Um, so I know Dr. Campbell said I wouldn't do slides first thing in the morning, death by PowerPoint. I'm not so gracious. So I have a few slides um, just to sort of keep me honest. And then do I use, I got some amazing. Okay, perfect. So a little bit of the background on NAVREF. So the National Association for Veterans Research and Education Foundations. It's a long acronym. I think DC is a city with lots of acronyms, but this one feels like we might have everyone beat. Um, NAVREF. So the NAVREF is a membership association. Um, we represent the nation's network of VA affiliated nonprofits. Um, the affiliated nonprofits were actually established by Congress in the late 80s to serve as a flexible funding mechanism. Essentially, if Johnson & Johnson or Pfizer or if any of these industry partners said, hey, we've invented a cure for cancer or we've invented a cure for Alzheimer's and a veteran wants to be able to access that trial, they wanted to set up a nonprofit infrastructure that could facilitate all of these activities because at the end of the day, the NIH or PCORI or Robert Wood Johnson or Merck, whatever organization you can think of, they can't just send the VA a bunch of money and say, okay, now go do research because Congress is the only body that has the ability to do that. So sort of innov innovatively for the 80s, they said, what if we were to set up a nonprofit infrastructure that would serve as this flexible funding mechanism, it would be the intermediary to accept external funds to advance VA's research and education mission. So it started as one VA-affiliated nonprofit back in 1988, now is a network of 79 VA-affiliated nonprofits all across the country. A big question I get is why are there 79? How come you don't just have one? One of the biggest reasons is because, as many of you know, 
the rich tradition of partnership between academic medical centers and the VA sort of goes back to the very beginnings of the agency itself. And so oftentimes when clinical research is happening, the awards are, you know, split between the academic and the VA because, you know, the VA brings in the best and brightest and oftentimes they're also having appointments at the university. So as a result, we have almost 80 VA-affiliated nonprofits <clears throat> that have been authorized to work specifically with the private sector, with philanthropy, with state governments, with other agencies to accept funds so that VA can advance their research and education missions. NAVREF represents all 80 of these nonprofits. So we're always thinking about ways that we can make it easier for research and for education to really be supported across the VA um, continuum and ways that we can work with partners in a creative, flexible way to really fill in the gaps and the needs that we know that VA has particularly as it relates to emerging technologies. So a couple examples of what falls under research and education, um, and I will, I will own this, about 95% of all the work of the nonprofits falls under this first bullet under research, so clinical research trials. That's sort of the elephant in the room of what the nonprofits have been established and what their track record is around what they're able to do. Um, but then also things like fellowships, internships. Um, in St. Louis, anyone here from St. Louis? Okay, there we go. Um, in St. Louis, there, um, you know, Pfizer has actually established a postdoctoral fellowship. So for three years, they're um, going to have a fellow on site doing research with the VA, looking at pharmacoepidemiology. Um, and so there, there's this, there's a mechanism and there's a blueprint of ways that we can think about research fellowships and internships and research fellows. Um, precision medicine has obviously been a huge area of interest for oncology research and for the VA, particularly in light of PACT Act. So um, when I was at the VA, and I think in the last 10 years, um, you know, ORD has been working, Office of Research and Development worked really closely with the Prostate Cancer Foundation on a $50 million investment into precision oncology and into prostate cancer research. On the education side, I always remind people there is an E in NAVREF, even though research is sort of the, the big thing in the room that everyone gets really excited about. Um, but through the nonprofits is the ability to educate and train veterans, family members, staff. So a really, really huge authority and ability to think in a creative sort of brainstorming way about the opportunities, particularly with emerging technologies like VR, if you're trying to test and pilot and understand how best to deliver some of this training, you know, the nonprofits could sort of hold a key to one of the avenues to be able to do this work. Um, Simulation-based training. I just had the opportunity to visit Richmond. Anyone here from Richmond? Oh, I, I, I liked the like half raise. It sounds like there's a story of like, I'm sort of from Richmond, I'm not. But uh, um, so Rich Richmond's one of the similar centers, which I think is really fascinating. Having visited some of these sites, thinking about the opportunities to leverage this, not only for healthcare staff and provider training, but leveraging it for family members, you know, coming from the caregiver space, a huge need to think about all the needs of what they might need in the home. So Really excited to think about the opportunities within the nonprofit infrastructure to bring in some of these new technologies. So where are we located? Um, you know, there's 80 across the country. Our website has sort of a map of being able to put in the zip code and search very quickly. What I will say is if, you know, you're in an area and you don't see one of these flags over your state, that doesn't mean that, okay, I'm, you know, no go, there's nothing you can do. Reach out, let us know. We, we make things work all the time. Like I always say, I worked at the VA for a long time. You put smart people in a room, they usually figure out a way to get something done. So don't let the map, if it's, if it's in your area and you don't see a flag, don't let that stop you. So what does all this equate to? So, you know, 80 nonprofits all across the country. In FY22, these 80 nonprofits facilitated just north of $300 million in external research investments. So the way I think about it, the way, the easy way I describe it, because sometimes with the budget you sort of, you know, millions, billions, it's easy to lose track. VA's research budget is around, covers around $900 million for purely research initiatives. So the way I think, when I talk to the Hill, when I talk to other advocates, about one in every four dollars that the VA is spending on research is coming from an external entity. So who are these entities? Who are the groups, right? NIH is probably the biggest funder that everyone thinks about. So anytime you hear about an NIH trial happening at the VA, one of the VA's nonprofits are the mechanisms by which that money is flowing. 
Um, private industry, so we mentioned some of the pharmaceutical and biotech companies, DOD, state and local governments, um, PCORI, Robert Wood Johnson, Prostate Cancer Foundation, all of those other sorts of organizations, all are the primary sort of facilitators and funders of research today. Um, my personal thing, I've been with NAVRA for about eight to nine months, or almost a year. Um, I'm really excited to grow this because having worked sort of on both sides of VA, outside, so many people want to support the VA and so many people are interested in innovation in testing new research and new interventions. And to me, this whole ecosystem um, could be doing so much more collaboratively with other funders, with other partners to really plug into these needs and the gaps that we know that veterans are facing. So. I'm really excited, and that's been a lot of the conversations I've been having with Dr. Kirsch and with Anne about ways we can leverage this infrastructure to really meet the needs of innovation and of technology. So I always sort of share this because I think there's a lot of innovation and research that's already happened at the VA. Um, I know VR feels like the latest thing, but there's a really rich tradition of history across um, the VA when it comes to research. So if anyone's ever heard the secretary speak, you've probably heard a few of these. You know, they invented the nicotine patch, pacemaker, pioneered transplant technology. So I always share this because, A, I don't think a lot of people know that the VA has done these things, and it's important to say it's a taxpayer-funded organization. And you know, investing in the VA isn't just about improving veterans' lives, it's about advancing American public health. Um, but also, there's a rich tradition of innovation and creation and thinking of new ways about how we deliver health care. So everything that we're here doing today, everything that the exhibitors are doing in the VA, I think just, just follows in this rich tradition that exists at the VA around thinking more innovatively about how to deliver high-quality care. And all of this sort of leads to... Next year, in 2025, the VA research program is turning 100 years old. Um, my joke is that it doesn't look a day over 98, but it's turning 100 years old. And so one of the things I'm really excited about doing, you know, in this new role at NAVRAF and with partners like the innovation team, the digital health office, is thinking about this infrastructure, which has been around for 100 years, and how are we going to transform? How are we going to modify? How are we going to revolutionize the way that we've been doing research to really be responsive to the new technologies, to the emerging innovations that are coming out that we know could really have a benefit to how we deliver high quality care across the country? So we look very forward to working with all of you. Um, to learn more about NAVREF, you know, visit our website. I'm going to also have Liz raise her hand. Liz is um, also on our team and is going to be here throughout the day. So if you have questions about it, feel free to come up, send us an email. Um, we're really, really excited to be here and excited to collaborate and excited about the future. Thanks so much.